Hello, everyone. My name is Linnea Anderson, and on behalf of the Archives and Special Collections Department at the University of Minnesota Libraries, welcome to First Fridays Online. Today's presentation will also be posted later on the University of Minnesota Libraries YouTube channel, so you should be able to access it within the next few weeks. First Fridays is a monthly series of presentations made possible by a generous gift from Governor Elmer L. Anderson and Mrs. Eleanor Anderson in honor of former library director, Dr. Edward B. Stanford. The presentations are based on materials in the University Libraries archives and special collections. A special thank you to Audra and Alan from Middle English Interpreting who will be providing ASL interpretation for today's presentation. If you have any questions for our speaker today, you should submit them using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please use Q&A and not chat so that we can keep track of your questions. You can submit your questions at any time, but we will hold them until the end of the presentation and respond as time allows. Our presentation today is Join or Die, Political Cartoons in the Age of Revolution, presented by Margaret Ragnow, curator of the James Ford Bell Library. Political satire is a long held tradition in Western culture. This certainly was true in the late 17th and 18th centuries when peoples around the Atlantic world sought to throw off the yokes of oppression Today's talk will explore the context for these often cryptic cartoons, many of which coincide with examinations of the economic bubbles experienced in the 1720s. These are highlighted by the Bell's upcoming digital exhibition, The Panics and Plagues of 1720, A View from 2020, and by related programming at the University of Minnesota, the Newberry Library, and the New York Public Library. And now I will hand it over to our presenter, Margaret Ragnow from the Bell Library. Please enjoy the presentation. Thanks so much, Linnea. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. For those of you who are new to First Fridays, uh, the James Ford Bell Library, of which I'm curator, specializes in the history and impact of international trade and cultural exchange around the globe circa, uh, before circa 1800 CE. That can manifest itself in numerous ways, from manuscript collections to maps to pilgrimage accounts and travel narratives, geographies, and so much more. Among them, we found a variety of political cartoons, collections of individual cartoons that someone in years long past cut out of newspapers or magazines or cartoons that were republished in books as part of the commentary on historical events. Politics and the relationships among nations often affect commerce, they affect trade, sometimes inspiring a spate of political cartoons as we shall see. The political cartoons from the James Ford Bell Library collection that I'm going to show you today represent commentary on international politics and finance in the Atlantic world, leading up to and during the American Revolution, or what the British called the American War. They were originally published between 1721 and 1790. These cartoons represent the political humor and satire of the day, in most cases to get the joke, to comprehend why it was funny or satirical, you just had to be there. The 18th century readers of the publications in which these cartoons appeared understood them in a way that most of us today cannot. Likewise, of course, only those of us of a certain age will recognize these 20th century cartoons and their subjects. This afternoon, I'm going to show you several 18th century cartoons within their historical context, and for some, point out who the characters in the cartoons are meant to represent. I'll leave it to you to judge the humor or satire factor. I'll warn you, however, some of these cartoons are quite rude. 
In the May 9th, 1754 issue of his newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, printer, publisher, scientist, writer, and inventor, Benjamin Franklin, published a political cartoon he had drawn himself, showing eight British North American colonies as separated parts of a snake, the cartoon you see here. With the caption, join or die, Franklin labeled each of the separate sections of the snake with abbreviations for New York, New England, represented here uh, instead of four separate colonies, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Vermont, North and South Carolina. He left out Delaware, which was then part of Pennsylvania, and Georgia, as well as the British colonies further north in what is now Canada. There was a myth with roots in the legend of the Egyptian god Osiris that held that a snake cut into pieces would come back to life if the pieces were put together before sunset. Franklin's message here, separate, they were inert and impotent, united, they were active and powerful. Franklin's accompanying text urged the American colonies to unite with one another on behalf of British and colonial interests to defend against the French in the French and Indian War of 1754 to 1763. Uh, the French and Indian War was the North American theater of the broader conflict known as the Seven Years' War, which began two years later in 1756. This map illustrates that North American conflict. Uh, the pale yellow up here is New France, the French territory. This darker ochre color represents British possessions. And in the center, the tan between is the disputed territory. And as you can see, uh, for example, much of New York, uh, including Niagara Falls, lies in disputed territory. But this all came under British control when they had won the conflict uh, in 1763 under the Treaty of Paris. Franklin's cartoon is the first time the British colonies were asked to act as a single unit. This was the first American political cartoon. This pastiche of cartoons was published in 1721, following the debacles of the Mississippi bubble and the South Sea bubble, stock collapses to rival any of those we've experienced in recent decades. 2020 is the 300th anniversary of these so-called bubbles, and I and my staff are currently working on an online exhibition that not only will cover these, but also the plague and the smallpox outbreaks that occurred almost simultaneously. I think the folks in 1720 would be right at home in 2020, don't you? Today, I'm gonna to focus just on the South Sea bubble. The South Sea Company was a British joint stock company founded in 1711, created as a public-private partnership to consolidate and reduce the cost of the national debt. The company was also granted a monopoly to trade with South America, hence its name. At the time the company was created, Britain was involved in the War of Spanish Succession and Spain controlled South America. So there was no realistic prospect that trade would actually take place and the company never realized any significant profit from its monopoly. However, company stock rose in value as it expanded its operations dealing with government debt, peaking in 1720 before collapsing into little above its original flotation price. A considerable number, number of people were ruined by the devaluation of their shares and the national economy tanked, to put it mildly. The founders of the scheme engaged in insider trading using their advanced knowledge of when the national debt was to be consolidated to make large profits from purchasing the debt in advance. Here is a depiction from a French book addressing all of the horrendous economic events of 1720 of one such founder whom the cartoonist calls the bubbling bubble master. Company money was used to deal in its own shares and selected individuals buying shares were given loans backed by those same shares to spend on purchasing more shares. This cartoon from the same volume 
depicting the seller of shares with his magic lantern, illustrates the illusory nature of these so-called investments. It was the expectation of vast wealth from trade with South America that encouraged the public to purchase shares, despite the limited likelihood that this would ever happen. Following a parliamentary inquiry, a number of politicians were disgraced and the people who were found to have profited illegally from the company had their assets confiscated proportionately to their gains. Now this sounds good, but since most of these men were already rich, few were ruined, unlike the small individual investors who lost everything. In the aftermath of the South Sea bubble, the British economy was even more hard pressed. The South Sea Company wasn't the only joint stock company in Britain to seek investors to help deal with the national debt. Most of the post-bubble investors were foreign. Dutch speculators had gambled heavily in the South Sea Company, but were sufficiently shrewd to avoid the more obvious swindles. And they became the primary investors in British stock. By 1737, it is estimated that the British were paying the Dutch more than one million pounds a year in interests on their investments. The Dutch continued to buy up British shares, invest in its bond market, and otherwise create a uh, economic dependency through the early 1760s, leading in fact to the first Anglo-Dutch war. In this Dutch cartoon, a fat Englishman sits on a table suspended by a chain to the horn of a unicorn. The table represents the Bank of England. The unicorn, its unrealistic financial position. A Frenchman over here pulls the Englishman on the leg assisted by a Spaniard. A Native American child sitting here behind uh, the Englishman representing the British colonies is holding the Englishman's arm and admonishing him with an upraised finger. A Dutchman holds a leg of the table to prevent the Englishman from falling, an allusion to Dutch investment in Great Britain stabilizing British credit. The poem underneath this portrait of a confused Europe refers to Great Britain as Jack for Union Jack, its flag. It reads, bold Jack, pray, what's the business today? Foo, pox, a plot, mistaken for a play, this hurly-burly spoils your sport. You'll find there's humor to your face and more behind. Amazing fool, yet tottering on thy bench, though scorned by Spain and cousined by the French. Only the Dutch, not laughing at your nose, good-natured helps to snatch whate'er you lose. While this cartoon lauds the Dutch as the saviors of Britain, this next cartoon warns against Dutch investments in British securities and makes a plea for self-sufficiency. A wealthy Dutchman pours money into the apron of his fellow countrymen while refusing the request for money by representatives of foreign countries. So here is the... Um, the wealthy Dutchman taking sacks of money out of this chest and pouring it into the apron here. And here are the representatives of foreign countries um, begging for their share of the handouts. In the foreground here is the French cock or rooster perched on the rump of the British dog while the Dutch lion approaches. There are emblematic figures in the clouds and a fleet of ships in the background. To the right, a temple is being restored uh, or possibly destroyed. It's, it's difficult to tell and I haven't really decided of which yet. This is the economic and political situation on the eve of the American Revolution and things don't get better for Britain. Britain had licensed privateers to help attack French shipping during the Seven Years' War, but the government lost control of them. British forces tasked with defending the American colonies 
had a difficult time fi finding sailors to serve on coastal vessels. Sailors found more lucrative employment in the privateers who paid higher wages and offered shares in prize money that was rarely available to those on shore patrol. This map titled the British Empire depicts the colonies and those coastal waters that Britain sought to protect, particularly against incursions by the French. And I'm going to zoom in here on this for you. Um, so here you can see um, we've got New France sandwiched up between the Canadian colonies and then um, the British colonies along the coastline, and they extend all the way down here to Bermuda. That's a lot of coastline to protect when you're on the other side of the ocean. As time went on and privateering proved to be tremendously lucrative, it wasn't only French vessels that were attacked and commandeered. Privateers started preying on the ships of so-called neutral nations as well. Of course, sometimes neutrality was a guise to smuggle French goods into American ports. To combat this, Britain passed the rule of war in 1756. This basically stated that British privateers could prey on the shipping of enemy nations, and in fact, anyone trading with France or carrying French goods and claim the cargo. For those of you not familiar with this tactic, it goes well back into the Middle Ages. Governments issue something called a letter of mark, which was a license granting individual captains the right of seizure that the rule of law granted on a wholesale basis. In fact, Article 1, Section 8 of the US Constitution grants Congress the authority to issue letters of mark and reprisal the same authority of seizure plus license to bring the captured vessels back to their home port. The privateer captains who captured ships under letters of mark and reprisal, as well as under the rule of war of 1756, brought their prizes into a port, often the closest one, and presented their claim before a prize court. Um, it was this court that judged whether the seizure was lawful. And um, we have court cases going back to the Middle Ages where captains are arguing that their letter of mark was still in play, even if the armed conflict um, had ceased to exist. And so often these uh, legal batters took years to resolve with the profit, uh, the cargo sitting in some warehouse waiting for the issue to be resolved. The last time the US issued letters of mark and reprisal was during the War of 1812, although the issue has come before Congress several times since, uh, including after 9-11, although the measures failed to pass. In the mid 18th century, however, growing tensions between England and her colonies caused several American prize court judges to rule in favor of the so-called neutral vessels that had been commandeered by Britain's privateers. This reduced the amount of money coming into the British treasury from captured vessels and England's be economy became even more precarious. Between 1764 and 1765, Parliament passed a series of acts to raise revenues following the end of the Seven Years' War, which ended in uh, 1763 all greatly resented by the American colonies, but none more so than the Stamp Act of 1765, which affected all aspects of life in the colonies. And as you can see on this slide, um, the British government required a special paper with an embossed revenue stamp for almost all public documents, legal documents, commercial documents, um, bills of sale, deeds of gift, um, you know, mortgages on houses, everything, uh, newspapers, and then oddly also on playing cards, and I'm not quite sure <laughs> why, um, but the stamp paper was very expensive. It had to be purchased with British currency instead of colonial paper money, which was much more difficult to come by. Ironically, Benjamin Franklin's join or die cartoon, originally calling the colonies to unite on behalf of Britain, was republished by James Parker in the single September 21st, 1765 issue of the Constitutional Courant 
attacking the Stamp Act. Parker called for the unification of the colonies against Great Britain in a struggle for economic justice. Franklin's partner, David Hall, refused to comply with the act, printing the Pennsylvania Gazette on plain paper with a masthead that declared no stamped paper to be had as a way to get around the law. In England during this period, Franklin, again, created this cartoon, another scene of dismemberment like his earlier snake allegory, and printed it on cards, which he passed out to members of parliament in London. Uh, Franklin wanted parliament to understand the moral of their actions. The financial ruin of the colonies would ultimately maim Britain. And as you can see here, uh, he's labeled the dismembered parts of uh, this figure with the names of Britain's American colonies. Here is New York, we have New England over here. Uh, that's Pennsylvania, Virginia here. Um, a rather gruesome depiction, um, but I think it got his message across. Parliament repealed the Stamp Act in March of 1766. This French cartoon makes fun of Britain while the Second Continental Congress is taking place in Philadelphia in 1775. In November of that year, the Congress established the Secret Committee of Correspondence to create diplomatic relations with European nations. Benjamin Franklin, a member of the committee, played an active role in communicating with influential members of the Spanish and French aristocracy in the interests of forging alliances with both countries. This was extremely subversive to British interests. But the French defeat in the Seven Years' War motivated the French against the British in this conflict. It was this second Congress that adopted the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Now in this cartoon, uh, you can see the milk cow in the center, which represents British commerce. It's being emasculated by having its horn cut off by an American, uh, represented here uh, by the feathers in the hat, which were used in a lot of cartoons to signify Native Americans. And in this instance represents here the Second Continental Congress. A good humored Dutchman is uh, sitting in front milking the cow, again, representing the huge amount of interest the British were paying the Dutch, while a Frenchman and a Spaniard look on holding out bowls of their own, obviously um, uh, signaling that they are hoping to get a piece of this financial pie. A British ship is seen foundering in the background next to the city of Philadelphia where the Congress is taking place. And here um, you can see two men who have been labeled brothers uh, from the city of brotherly love. Uh, they're seen dozing in the front here. Um, on the right hand side, you see the Lion of Britain sleeps and not even a little dog dancing on its back can wake it up. An Englishman stands by distressed, but not taking any action. When the war broke out in April of 1775, the city of New York was already an important center of business and trade although it occupied only the lower portion of Manhattan Island. And that's right, right here. There's a little bit up here, but primarily, primarily here. It was politically divided with a loyalist assembly, but active patriot organizations. And following the battles of Lexington and Concord, the patriots seized control of the city and began exiling the loyalists. In this French illustration, slaves have been tasked with pulling down a monument to Great Britain while bystanders depicted in both British red and colonial blue look on. Uh, just an indication that pulling down unwanted statues is nothing new. Then in the early summer of 1776, British General George Howe launched a campaign to retake the city and um, on 15 September, 1776, Howe landed on Manhattan and marched on ha Harlem. Fighting ensued. And this French illustration refers to the triumphant return of royal forces to New York. Uh, 
However, by the 19th of September, just a few days later, a fire had started down by the docks. Some argued that it was arson both at the time and since. The fire quickly spread across the city, both helped and hindered, as this illustration depicts, by the armed forces and citizens. And you can see uh, people looting buildings um, or trying to salvage their own belongings. Um, some of the uh, royal forces are um, wielding sticks um, against the fire and other people who are attempting to defend their homes. Um, sounds kind of familiar. Estimates of the destruction vary widely, uh, stating that from 400 to 1,000 buildings were destroyed, between 10 and 25% of the approximately 4,000 buildings in the city at the time. But according to the caption that's on this illustration, King's College was destroyed along with 1,600 houses, considerably more than the uh, official estimates, along with Trinity College, or Trinity Church rather, and other churches, as well as a school for the poor children of the city. These prints were published in 1776, shortly after the event. And although they're hand colored, you can see on this one evidence of haste. The typesetter has set the header up here um, backwards. So you can see that it's, it's been, it, when it printed, um, it printed backwards. Okay, um, let's see. In 1654, at the end of the first Dutch Anglo War, the Dutch were forced to sign the Treaty of Westminster, which required them to recognize and abide by the Navigation Act of 1651, prohibiting the colonies to trade directly with the Dutch, the French, and the Spanish. And I should probably remind everyone that Although there's a lot of detail in this talk, there's not going to be a test at the end. However, during the early years of the American Revolution, the Dutch traded with the Americans anyway. In 1780, Empress Catherine II of, created the first league of armed neutrality, declaring Russia's armed neutrality in the conflict between the Americans and the British. She endorsed the right of neutral countries to trade by sea with nationals of the belligerent countries without hindrance, except in weapons and military supplies. This action then supported and justified the Dutch trade with the Americans. In this cartoon, the Netherlands, personified as freedom and carefulness, and that's right here, complains to justice, sitting on this throne here with the scales of justice in her hands, um, complains to justice about the robbing of its ships at sea by England. A variety of other figures appear in the center, virtuously representing the League members. Here, a British version personifies carelessness and robbery, you see with stocks, a yoke being put on Britain, and a female figure wearing the Russian imperial crown, no doubt meant to be Catherine herself, personifies gratitude. In the air from the weapons bearing arm of the League of Armed Neutrality dangle the coats of arms of Russia, Sweden, Denmark, and the Dutch Republic. Nevertheless, in spite of the creation of the League, or as some might argue because of it, the British declared war on the Dutch in December of 1780, thus beginning the fourth Anglo-Dutch War of the 18th century. In this Dutch cartoon, if we begin on the left over here, we see a Dutchman pointing to the Treaty of Westminster that had been attached to the wall with um, a Dutch housewife starting to remove it. If you look closely up here, you can see corpses. And these are corpses of British soldiers. And in the foreground here, this Dutchman walks on one of the corpses toward the outstretched arms of a Native American, another representation of the American colonies. In the center, 
a crown woman here representing Empress Catherine holds out a dish to the Dutch lion seated on the throne in front of her with justice standing behind the throne. You see the scales of justice again. Once again, a dog is representing Britain. And you see, this is a Frenchman forcing the dog representing Great Britain to lap up excrement coming from the Dutch lion. While a Spaniard blows puffs of air, uh, the ubiquitous hot air, uh, into the Frenchman's ear with a bellows. And in the background, an Englishman kneels before a Dutchman who gives him a slice of bread, yet another dig at the British debt owed to the Dutch. While on the other side, across the sea, English buildings begin to fall over and sink between the waves. The British nation is in distress, both economically and politically, and at war with both America and the Netherlands. This cartoon depicts the English, represented again by a dog, a very large dog, um, beset by France, Spain, and America. The Netherlands holds the dog's tail in a cleft stick with Empress of Catherine of Russia looking on. In the background, John Paul Jones whips a crowned woman, the proud queen of the sea, Great Britain, who is stripped to the waist and tied to a pole. These cartoons pull no punches. The Dutch gave shelter to Jones in 1779, which caused an uproar in Britain and contributed to the declaration of war. Political cartoons such as these can inform us of attitudes to political and economic situations in ways that textbooks can only hint at. At the beginning of the 18th century, the British economy was troubled by an economic crisis that led them to issue licenses to joint stock companies, some of them very shady like the South Sea Company that led to huge foreign investment and the partial collapse of the British economy. British colonial interests became even more important and mid-century, the British became embroiled in the Seven Years' War in part to protect those interests. However, their attempts to exercise tight economic control backfired, leading not only to the American Revolution, but also to the League of Armed Neutrality and the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War. As we've seen today, these conflicts were also played out through political commentary and political cartoons. While we may not fully understand all of the humor or satire, 18th century readers certainly did, just as we understand the political cartoons of today. Franklin's Join or Die cartoon appeared once again in 1774 when Paul Revere used it in slightly altered form for the masthead of the Massachusetts spy, where it became a symbol of colonial freedom during the Revolutionary War. It was repurposed yet again by both the Union and the Confederacy in the American Civil War. And more recently, one enterprising undergraduate student who happened to be both a Bell Library student staff member and president of the History Club used it on a club recruiting poster, at least until her advisors suggested that it might not be as humorous to some as it was to her. She has since graduated, but use of the cartoon continued for quite a while. I think Ben Franklin would have been proud. Thank you. And uh, I will stop sharing my screen and we can move on to questions. Thank you, Maggie. I hope everyone enjoyed the, the presentation. Um, I see that we have one question so far that asks, does the V in Franklin's cartoon represent Virginia rather than Vermont? Um, in the cartoon that shows the woman dismembered, um, 
it actually is Virginia. You can see the um, V I R G written out on the limb. Um, I think it represents. Um, I think it's. I think it's Virginia in the second one too, or the first one too. Um, I'd have to go back and take another look at it. Um, let's see here. Um, I think it's meant to represent Virginia. Um, yeah. Um, the next question asks, were cartoons accessible to lower caste class people or just the educated elite? And actually, um, most of these were accessible to the entire population because they were printed in newspapers um, that were widely distributed. They were sometimes printed as broadsides along with accompanying text and pasted to walls or poles. Um, like we saw the Treaty of Westminster in that one cartoon. So this was a way for even people who um, couldn't read or had poor reading skills to recognize through, um, largely through the hats that the people in the cartoons wore to see which countries are being represented. And because they understood the political events of the day, they could understand the cartoons. So, you see a Dutchman wearing a particular type of hat. Um, I called out the fact that they tend to put um, feathers standing straight up to indicate um, people from North America. Uh, crowns indicate, you know, the uh, king or queen. So I think um, they were generally accessible to m most people. Um, Let's see, someone says it is interesting that these political cartoons are much more detailed than the political cartoons of today. Can I discuss that? Um, I think it's just represented the tastes of the time. Um, you know, we have a different aesthetic. And because we also have a variety of different types of media with television and with radio, um, we don't necessarily need to have things as spelled out as some of these cartoons may have required because um, we're not getting that information from multiple sources. Um, someone wants to know if there were attempts to censor cartoons, yes. Um, Ever since the beginning of the printing press, there have been attempts to censor the press. Um, and certainly the, the British were not fans of any of these cartoons and um, lots of measures were at least attempted to be evoked that um, prevented the sale, for example, or distribution of Dutch newspapers um, or magazines in England or its colonies. And so a lot of the cartoons I showed you today are in Dutch. The text is in Dutch um, and they're designed for a European audience, but they certainly made their way as contraband, if nothing else, um, into England and into the American colonies. Um, so uh, so, so there's that. And, um, and yes, Britannia is often a label uh, put on the crowned woman that represents um, England, um, standing for the entire British, uh, British Empire at the time. Um, let's see, someone has said something about cutting the horns and milking it to emasculate um, the cow, which is also being milked. Um, yeah, that is a bit confusing. Um, and as someone who is currently living in the 21st century, I am not going to attempt to figure out why, <laughs> um, uh, why that, why that is. Um, I think that probably has something to do with the humor of the day. Um, and that's something that I just don't, um, just don't get. <laughs> 
Um, someone else comments that they inherited a lot of the intense complexity from Baroque art, which is certainly probably uh, true. Um, and um, a Canadian in our audience asks about the fact that I use America to refer to the US. Um, was that common in the 18th century? Um, and, you know, I'm a Canadian and um, yes, it was um, common, again, depending on who was speaking. Um, North America and South America had been labeled with the term America starting in the 16th century. Um, and so it was, it was quite common um, until after, until the Revolutionary War, until the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were signed into law, um, we were not the United States. Um, let's see, someone else mentions um, the personification of big ideas in these cartoons like justice or empire. When did that practice fall away? Um, I'm not sure that it actually did fall away. Um, I think it just depends on what, what the subject of the commentary um, might be. Um, and I may be thinking of, you know, 20th century cartoons that featured the scales of justice. I'm not sure. Perhaps we don't use reference that too much anymore today, but certainly in my lifetime, I've seen cartoons um, using that. And um, someone who knows more about cattle than I certainly do um, say that cattle of both sexes used to have horns, um, that some still do, and they're, they were cut off. And I assume that means that they were um, bred out of, of some uh, different varieties of, um, of cattle. Um, let's see. I think that is actually, oh, here's another one. Um, were the individual cartoonists recognized as individual artists in their day or were they anonymous and indistinguishable? Um, occasionally people would sign their cartoons or for example, when they appeared in a publication like the Pennsylvania Gazette, which was very much Franklin's publication um, it was usually implied, unless otherwise stated, that um, Franklin was the creator of those cartoons, or at least he was responsible for the cartoons uh, coming into being. Um, for some of the Dutch cartoons, I can see little scribbles in the corners where there looks like there might have been a signature, um, but it's hard to tell if that is a signature for the cartoon or it refers to the, en the engraver or the printer um, because the cartoons that we have in the collection were cut out of their original publication. It's really difficult uh, to tell. Um, sometimes the, the margins have been cut off, so you don't know what might have been printed under the images, et cetera. Um, let's see, was the use of political cartoons used much after the United States became independent in the early days of the US? I don't think there has ever been any sort of seizure in the use of political cartoons to comment on what's going on in our country or around the world. Um, it is a very long tradition. Um, Franklin's cartoon, The Joiner Die, has been labeled the first American political cartoon, but political cartoons had been printed and published since the very advent of the printing press. And um, I don't think that there is, um, there was any sort of uh, lag um, after we became um, the United States of America. Uh, someone also asked, is there a distinction between these cartoons and satirical art by Hogarth and others? Um, not really, uh, more a question of 
the use to which they were put, um, where they were published. Um, a lot of cartoons were repurposed. So um, published or created in one context and then somebody picks them up and uses them again. Um, copyright as we understand it today was a very fluid thing back then. And um, so it wasn't always considered plagiarism to do that. And sometimes they did obtain permission or um, in many instances, for example in, in example, in Britain, you had to have a license to print. And so if reusing something came under your license or you got approval for it from the license, um, that was between the printer or publisher and the British Crown and often did not involve the actual original creator of the artwork. Um, somebody wants to know, um, were they printed in a intaglio process? Um, generally, they were printed um, just as an engraving as part of the regular cartoon. So not a separate process as the newspaper or the magazine page. Um, so uh, I don't think um, that process, unless I'm misremembering what that process is, wasn't particularly involved. Um, let's see. Repercussions against cartoonists. We cannot forget the hubbub in France after a cartoonist published one with a representation of Mohammed, which is prohibited by Islam. Um, oh yeah, I mean, there are complaints, lawsuits, libel cases, um, following cartoons, just like there are for anything else. Um, Generally, because of our freedom of the press, in this country, cartoonists are protected under that just as any other writer would be protected. Um, um, so, uh, so that's the case there. Um, someone comments that it seems that political cartoons of today are focused on one particular subject, at least in the Star Tribune. Is this common? Um, no, it isn't. Um, I think it really depends on what's going on in the world. Um, certainly Dutch newspapers during this period um, who saw Britain interfering with their economy and also because of the huge debt Britain owed to the Dutch, anything that Britain did that affected their economy ultimately affected their ability to pay the Dutch back. And so that was really important to Dutch investors and to the Dutch economy. So um, it would have been a particularly um, popular topic uh, in Dutch publications during that particular period, but it wasn't the only one. And I. I didn't select our entire cartoon collection. I only selected ones that sort of fit this theme. I, it doesn't look like there are any other questions. So I know this was a little complicated and um, fortunately uh, the cartoons will be available on the recording where you'll be able to zoom in on them and see them a lot better than you may have been able to see them during the presentation, um, but I hope you enjoyed it and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Maggie, and thank you again, Alan and Audra. Um, and a reminder that you can see video of today's presentation on the University of Minnesota Library's YouTube channel, so check for that in a few weeks. And we hope you will join us online on February 5th for two presentations. The Adventure of the Pandemic Posts by Tim Johnson, curator of the Sherlock Holmes collections. Learn how sharing artwork on social media from the Sherlock Holmes collector collections by renowned illustrator Frederick Dorr Steele turned into a chance to boost morale, inspire action, and subtly comment on current events. And a presentation telling trans stories on the radio the Treader Transgender Oral History Podcast Project 
presented by Treader Collection staff. In June 2020, the Treader Collection launched a new project, an audio podcast that uses interviews from the Treader Transgender Oral History Project to tell stories about the history of the struggle for transgender rights. In this presentation, Treader staff will use stories from the project to explore the ways in which trans movements for justice offer unexpected lessons for everyone seeking to transform the world. Thanks again for attending, and we look forward to seeing you online in February.